in the meantime, we're moving on to our next speaker. And our next speaker is Paul O'Cunnula, uh, a multi-award winning writer, travel editor at Independent and Independent.ie. Paul is a regular contributor to National Geographic Traveller, where recent features of his have ranged from the Waterford Greenway to wilderness adventures in the Philippines. He's a regular speaker at travel media and food events. He's the current British Guild of Travel Writers, Travel Writer of the Year. And he's going to talk to us about food tours. Paul. Thanks, Mill, Olivia. Uh, it's lovely to be here, and great array of speakers. I'm delighted to be a part of it. I hope I can add something. My topic is going to be food tourism, so I don't know whether that's timed well or poorly in terms of your appetites, but we'll see how we go. Just quickly, Olivia gave you the basic details about me there. I write for National Geographic Traveller. I'm the travel editor with the Irish Independent for its weekend magazine. It's online stuff on independent.ie, and most importantly, I'm a dad and a husband. I love to travel. I love taking these two kids, Rosa and Sam, with me on the road. I got into travel because I love the experience, the immersion of it. I'm not particularly into the stats and that kind of stuff, but I love going somewhere that makes me want to tell my friends about it, that, makes me, that gives me a memory. And that's the way I approach travel in my work and in my play. Before I go on to the first thing, let's just learn something quickly about you guys. Can you give me a show of hands? Whose business is solely about food? <coughs> Excuse me, food. Now, whose business is partly about food? Okay, who eats? <laughs> is everybody up there? I hope there's everybody up there. Because my first question, what is food tourism? Is basically a bit of everything. Um, my last trip I went to Galway and it struck me of all of the things I did there in the city related to food somehow. There was of course the visits to restaurants which food is purely their business. I took a food tour with Sheena Dignamore. We spent a couple of hours going from everything from chocolate cafe to uh, grabbing little taster bites. Um, I, uh, we, we, I went and ate in Lone, which was the first time I'd eaten there, Galway's Michelin star restaurant. Food touches almost everything that we do as tourists and travellers. So that's the first thing. It's the pursuit and the enjoyment of unique and memorable food experiences both far and near. I was searching for a definition and that's one of the best ones I got. That's from the World Food Travel Association, which is a research body. But it does leave one thing out. <laughs> anybody who eats food will also know you need to drink. You can't underestimate the importance of drink, be it Guinness, be it craft spirits, be it non-alcoholic drinks, particularly here in Ireland. This is a gin library that I visited last weekend in Gal Gorm in Northern Ireland. It just added its 300th bottle of gin. <laughs> so it is important. So food tourism can cover a very wide area. Okay, Next question, why so many foodies so quickly? Why all of a sudden is everybody splattering their Instagram with images of food? Why is it so big? Well, I think you probably know the answer to this. Firstly, food is super media friendly. It's all over the TV. You watch the shows on a Sunday night, you buy the cookbooks or you will buy them for Christmas. You will read those recipes and you will flick through those pages far more than you will ever cook in your own kitchen. <laughs> Food is on trend and it's everywhere. This is Anthony Bourdain, who came to Ireland recently to said, this is no country to be effing around with a croissant. Go big or go home. <laughs> Ireland is on this media landscape as well. And it has become, food has become a huge part of travel. Every time I take a trip, and any travel writer or editor will tell you this, food is essential to the experience. It's your three meals a day, but it's also your avenue into the destination. You end up writing about food experiences so much, it has become a huge draw for tourism organizations to get people into their city or their country. It's gone crackers in travel, it's everywhere. The, the next trend in terms of why is foodies, uh, food so big is experience. It's come up again and again today, that idea of authenticity, locality, immersion, experiential travel. This is Airbnb, who recently, you know them as the room sharing group, recently launched trips, which is basically experiences 
locals provide for their guests that they couldn't get with official tourism organizations. So you might have a guy stand up paddling down the River Liff or someone else giving you a behind the scenes tour of the Abbey. The key common denominator there is that they're local and that they're experiential. And that's exactly what food is. And we'll see a bit more about that as we go on. Okay, in that context, what's with all the social media? That might be a concert that you attended 10 years ago. Imagine the same concert today. What has changed? And how has it changed us? I think that the technology that we have in our hands today allows us to create this huge echo effect, to share like we've never been able to share before. But the sharing has always been with us. I don't think that's different. Here's an example. This is, I just looked for a foodie term on Instagram recently, gastropub. This is what came up. It's not all good, as anybody who's in food knows. I don't know if you've ever seen this uh, tweet from Martha Stewart. Can you even recognize it as food? It was an iceberg wedge with homemade Russian dressing, a perfect salad for the onion soup lunch, except it had an effect that Martha didn't mean it to have. It became a kind of a, a classic example of a rotten food shot. BuzzFeed's headline there, someone needs to tell Martha her food tweets are disgusting. Someone else, I won't go through all the comments that came under it, but you can find it. You'll find it as you go. Essentially, if you are working with social media and you are working with food, you need to do a couple of key things right. And I'm sure all of you are on top of this, but it's worth reiterating. You need to think visually. We share, we're visual creatures. You need to keep it real. You need to have an authentic voice. There's no point just posting what you're told to post. post. It needs to be you. You need to have a strategy and you need to have discipline in putting that strategy out there. There's no point being super on social media for a week or going, going back and on Monday morning saying, right, I'm gonna get it together and then it fades out throughout the next week and the next month. You need to stick with it and you need to know what you're doing. You need to know who your audience are, who's looking at your tweets and your Instagrams and your Facebooks. And you need to know which platform suits you. So whose business is on Facebook? Give us a, a quick show of hands. Whose business is on Facebook and Twitter? And whose business is on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram? So roughly that's how we use social media. Facebook is by far the most popular platform and then people find their way through it after that. Okay, stacking up the points. The next question I have is probably one that a lot of people come to me in tourism and they go, what is this all about? Hipsters with beards, and pouring the filter coffee and organic this and pesto that and I just get a fry. Well, why should I care about food? There's a couple of answers. First of all, it can put you on the map. It makes business sense. This is Magnus Nielsen, the chef from Favikin, the Swedish restaurant you may have heard of. It's 600 miles north of Stockholm. It seats about 14 people. It's booked out till June. And the price for dinner is Swedish kroner 3,000. That is 306 euro per person. If you build it, if you do it right, they will come. Foodies are prepared to pay a premium <coughs> if you get it right. And I think Ireland, because Ireland is becoming such an expensive destination, I think that's something we should bear cognizance of. If I ask you to picture Las Vegas, would this come to mind? Las Vegas is a destination that really drilled into its food over the last 10 years or so, attracting lots of celeb chefs, Gordon Ramsay, Sarah, Wolfgang Puck, you name it. But it recognized that it was known for gambling, it wanted to diversify that, it wanted to future-proof itself to a degree, it added its shopping, it added lots of excursions, but the thing I was most surprised by was the quality of the food. Copenhagen is another huge example. If you rewind it about 15 or 20 years in Denmark, but um, Copenhagen was not particularly a foodie place. It has this population exactly the same as Ireland, just over five million. And along came this chap, and he dreamt it all up, and basically created, or him, his protégés, the people who watched him, created new Nordic <coughs> cuisine. He brought enormous business 
to Copenhagen. If, I, if you say the word Copenhagen now, it's one of the first things you think about is food. And there's no reason why if you said Dublin or Killarney or Ireland in a couple of years' time, that couldn't be the same reaction. Because we have the ingredients and we have the people to do it. These are the only kind of figures that are important. You eat three meals a day. Ireland gets around 10 million visitors a year and they spend about 2 billion on food. Food is all over tourism. Here's another quick illustration of why you should care. This is a man called Dennis Quinn, whom I took a tour with in Mayo recently. You mentioned the oysters in Balaná. Mm -hmm. We were very near to Balaná, and Dennis took me out for a foraging walk with a soup spoon and a bag and he dug mussels and clams out of the earth, took me back to the boot of his car, pulled out a pot and a stove, cooked them up with a bit of wine and a slice of lemon, and it was one of the loveliest food experiences I've had. Super simple, super rough, but I learned so much about Balaná, I ate the food, I picked myself, like they talk about farm to fork, it doesn't get better than that. It is essential in telling the story of a place and putting that place in front of you, giving you that immersive experience. It doesn't have to be in Ireland. That picture on the left was taken in San Sebastian. That's a typical bar in the evening time in San Sebastian. On the right from Lima in Peru, a woman making up her local ham looks like a Waterford blah, as they've been doing in that bar for nearly 100 years. Food is everywhere in travel. Food's fun food social, and everybody eats. I'm gonna keep drumming that in. Food tours, I don't know if you've ever taken one. There's a food tour I took in Dublin with Ketty from Delicious Dublin. There's a food tour I took in Burr, Dubai, in the middle of the own town, in which I learned that Dubai has a, a, a super vibrant Indian community in its old city, where we went to this street side hatch and ate this wonderfully fresh naan bread. Now, you asked me to describe Dubai before I went and I would have told you about six-star hotels and camels and uh, dune bashing and whatever, but after spending two or three hours with this girl, I knew more about Dubai, I knew more about the Emirate and the culture than I ever would have done visiting those places. Food was my access point. And there's a, a tour I took in Brooklyn. Would you prefer the top pizza or the bottom pizza? That's its premise. Hop on a bus in Manhattan, let's go tour Brooklyn, let's taste pizza, and as we go, this guy's gonna tell me funny stories, gonna show me the garage from Goodfellas, he's gonna walk me past the line at Grimaldi's, hand me the pizza, say that this one's cooked for three minutes at 400 degrees over coal, they make their own mozzarella, this one's from Sicily, it's a big fat doughy bread, which do you prefer? Three hours later, I knew more about Brooklyn, than I would have done taking any other kind of tour. Food was my in. Food tourism, that is what it can provide you. And it's only the tip of the iceberg, guys. Cookery schools, farm tours, tasting trails, markets. There are so many ways into this, so many things that we take for granted <coughs> that can be treated as tourist attractions too. What food does, like no other product, is it takes your destination and makes a story out of it takes your culture, your heritage, the traditions, the way the food is made, what the food is, is it lamb from the mountains of Ackle Island, is it fish from the sea, is it cheese made in a farmhouse, from the landscape that everybody loves so much about Ireland, prepared by the people and served on a plate that you go pop with your phone and put on Instagram, all through food. There's no other experience like it. You're literally taking it on board. Um, you've talked about a lot of the industry issues earlier, which I won't uh, rehash, other than to say an interesting one Fault Charles has been doing recently is taste of place. Feeds into what I'm saying about it, putting food place on a plate. One weakness in terms of Irish food is that the bigger tourist attractions, or tourist attractions generally, whatever they may be, zoos, uh, museums, interpretive centers don't tend to have do food particularly well. So they're zeroing in on this. They're trying to say, well, you have a captive audience of millions of people every year. 
who all have a chance to sit down, they're in Ireland, to experience these stories that we do so well. Let's, let's step this up, and I think that really needs your support in the years to come. Okay, so progressing towards the latter half of the questions I have for you. What kind of trends, if you're into food tourism, do you need to keep an eye on today? The first one you've probably noticed is the fast, fresh food. Of course, we're never going to lose our beloved Supermax and McDonald's and all the rest of them. Despite the fact that foodies all say we hate them, they, customers vote with their feet. They're an essential part of the, the landscape. But there's been a huge boom in fast, fresh food recently, particularly in the cities. Lunchtime crowds, um, you'll have seen guys like Chopped, like Freshy and so on. Um, another, uh, another trend that we've no I've noticed in the last 10 years in Ireland is we've suddenly recaptured this ability to do the basics. Now, when my parents were growing up, there was bread from a baker, you got meat from the butcher, um, you had someone who made the pastries, that suddenly disappeared for some reason when I went through sort of college and into my early years as a parent, but we've started to recapture it. Suddenly people are just getting the simple stuff like burgers, like pizza. That's a photograph of a pizza taken from the firehouse in Delgany, near where I live. Like pastries and fresh bread, soda bread, Irish bread. How did we lose sight of that? And suddenly we're getting these artisan bakers back like we used to do this all the time. Just people are rediscovering the soul of it. The bread they produce in the firehouse, and you know if you go there on a Saturday afternoon and see the queue at the door, is slightly better than the sliced pan in the Tesco. <laughs> and I think it supports a few more jobs and it tells quite a richer story. But we're starting to do these basics well again. And that is a good thing. Sometimes less is more. We're seeing a lot more pairings of food and drink, and I think that's going to happen more and more, and it's something we should look at more in the future, particularly with beer, with Irish craft beers paired with foods on menus, and with spirits. Maybe not during the dinner, maybe after. That's, incidentally, that last picture was taken in a bar in Dublin, where you can buy the burger, and this is our newest Michelin star, the Wild Honey Inn in Lisdun Varna. Who would have thunk it five or ten years ago? Here we are, casual food with a Michelin. Maybe it's, it's going a bit far to call it casual, but that kind of dining setting, getting a Michelin star, is a big deal for Ireland. Um, the fundamental trend that all of these things tie together is that we've gone from viewing eating out as a fine dining, get dressed up, something we do for special occasions. There's fancy glassware, white linen, towards casual. Comfy spaces, seafood, back to basics, places we're happy to eat and drink, places where both women and men feel comfortable, spaces where we're allowed to be ourselves. And now to look at it, it seems like a no-brainer. Of course, we'll always want the fine dining, and there's a place for it, absolutely. But the excitement in the Irish food and Irish food tourism scene is at the casual end at the moment. Local, authentic, and personal. They're the words I'll drill into again and again. Here's one other example in terms of the local. Has anyone ever eaten hazel mountain chocolate? Yes. In the burn? Fiona, well done. Uh, Kasia and John set up their chocolate factory in the middle of the Burren. Again, who, who would have dreamed of this to set up a chocolate factory in the Burren with its, its rich heritage of chocolate production? <laughs> and the beans are growing everywhere on those stones. But um, they, have, they, they tie in with the locality so well. Um, they use, you know, you'll find everything from honey to whiskey to nettles used in their products. They, they are, have just become a feature and a stop on every tour of the burn by tying all those elements of the story together. And they've created this wonderful business worth looking at as a case study. Okay, moving on. So, can food help me to stand out? Or how can it help me to stand out? Absolutely. And this is harder to do than ever. We've got so much, you saw all those stats about access and flights and tourism numbers and billions of this and billions of the other. So there's more competition and more people are competing for your business than ever. 
food can help you stand out in several ways. First of all, it gets picked up in the media. I would say that there's an article we did in The Independent around Ireland in 30 dishes recently, all about food tourism. We wanted to, to pick a dish that was uh, particular to each place, so we picked 30 and did a tour and a map based on it. There's another piece we did recently, 10 best burgers in Dublin, the, uh, the listicle, which is impossible to escape these days, but like those fast food places, people vote with their fingers as well as their feet. Anyway, um, other opportunities, this is Good Food Ireland's culinary and culture holidays, whole itineraries built around food, more of these are cropping up all the time. And of course, not too far from me here, Dingle is just an example of one food festival, of which there are many in Ireland. But they had this interesting idea. Anyone from Dingle here? Hello. Oh, of creating the Blossna Heron Awards not long ago. Don't be afraid to create, to dream things up, to start from the fresh. Food festivals, awards, they can hang your destination on them, they get the media coverage, they can really get you out there. So what's coming next in terms of food tourism? Well, um, there's a couple of things that we can keep our eye on in Ireland. This is Each Yard in Dublin. It's a new space attached to the Bernard Shore, Shaw, which is, I suppose, one of the archetypal hipster pubs in Dublin with the big blue bus that does the pizzas at the back, if you know it. They've gotten several food trucks into a, into a yard and they're absolutely thronged on Fridays and Saturdays rethinking our spaces, because particularly with foods, it's, with pubs, it can be difficult to produce uh, food and to segment your audiences. Um, I mentioned food pairings. That's a partnership that Guinness did with Angel Danger Donuts recently. Um, I think there's a big opportunity with the Irish breakfast. The one on the left you all know. The one on the right was created by Kevin Thornton this year with the Tipperary food producers. The idea was he created a, a recipe with local ingredients, of course, that he felt that people could roll out in their own establishments. It wasn't too hard to do. Now, it looks, looking at it there, <laughs> and I've had a fair amount of people on social media saying, give me the one on the left. <laughs> but <laughs> we, I mentioned the World Food Travel Association at the beginning. Um, Eric Wolf, who, who is its director, was in Ireland at Fault Ireland's Food Connect conference recently, and he said that the Irish breakfast is a gem without price. And I'm not sure we sell it enough. I'm not sure we develop it enough. I think people, um, I think people are eating a lot more breakfasts, a lot more brunches. Breakfast has become this meal that we could capitalize on. I think we're gonna see a lot of exciting stuff in breakfasts. And the other thing is the indoor spaces. That's the Bullet Hotel in Belfast, uh, newly opened. And they deliberately designed their, that, believe it or not, that is their entrance lobby. Um, it's got a bar, it's got the reception desk, it's got tables where you can just sit and have a drink, or tables where you can sit and order food from all day menus. And people are coming through, it's quite well designed in terms of traffic that you don't actually disrupt people and pull your wheelie bag over their Irish breakfast as you're going in. But the, the key thing here is that people no longer want to necessarily be tied down to times with food. They want the casual option, they want a space that is flexible and that they feel comfortable in, and it helps obviously if it's cool. So ha watch how spaces are developing. Um, just a quick recap before I bring it to a conclusion there. Good food tourism needs a sustained plan, to reiterate that. You need the right product, you need to do the quality, you need to work together on the same message and you need to know who your customers are. That's so important. So many people create this idealistic food product that nobody wants. You need to know who your business is. Is it local? Is it overseas? Who they are. So very quickly, before I finish up, it's not all good news. Um, Owen, you'll know this as well as anybody working in travel. A quick deconstruction of this. It's a beautiful picture, and it's a breakfast I had the privilege of eating. It's on Santorini in Greece, where nothing on that table was produced on the island. Thousands of passengers are gonna get off that cruise ship, come and overcrowd the streets of the village. So many people that they've had to cap the numbers. No one can order local fish because it's all sold out. 
and they're all going to go three or four hours later and take off. Sometimes there's eye wash, sometimes the reality isn't as we would like to see with tourism. We get people in these wonderful, open, receptive frames of mind. Don't disappoint them. So, there's a lot of people jumping on the bandwagon, saying stuff is local and seasonal when it's not, or it local to where, seasonal when, in Peru, perhaps. <laughs> there is a great degree of farm-to-table fatigue. I think the word hipster is almost gets a bad reaction now. There are confusing standards. What does organic mean? What does free range mean? What, does, what, are, what is a good food mile? What is, uh, you know, what language are we speaking here and how does the consumer understand it? We need to get on top of that and we need to educate people about the real price of food. I think food education is going to be a huge part of food tourism going forward. Why is it not okay to serve battered chicken breast on your menu in the west of Ireland to a visitor that, when that chicken came from Thailand or God knows where? It's clear to me why that's not okay and why that's a missed opportunity but it's not clear to everybody. So, Ireland, our petty fours, we're late to the table. We don't have a great food history. We have a problem with value for money that we've had. I think we're a little bit better in the last couple of years, a danger of getting worse again. We have an image problem overseas with food. People, the further you go beyond these shores, the more they think about Guinness and potatoes and it just all boils back to the leprechaun factor. We need to educate people about what we're doing with food. There's great inconsistency. It's as easy to get a bad, disappointing meal in Ireland as it is to get a great one. And are our staff properly educated? Do your staff know about coffee? Do they know about the trends we're discussing here? Do they know what consumers want? Do they know where the food provenance comes from? Do they know why it's important to be able to tell that to the person who's eating it? That's a question to ask. But we are in a beautiful position going forward. If you look, if you look at the air access and the optimism coming out of that, I feel the same about food. The people that I've mentioned to you today, these are all people I've met in the past year. You'll know some of them. Kieran who runs Sawyer's Deli in Belfast, Nevin in Black Lion, County Cavan, Karina from the, uh, Camerino in Dublin. There is nowhere you can get an interaction with people and food like you can in Ireland. There's nowhere you can get those stories linking the heritage, linking the culture, linking those beautiful fresh ingredients with people with those skills like you can in Ireland. There's nowhere you get that sense of landscape a sense of place on that place in front of you, like you can in Ireland. I open by, dis by defining, if you like, food tourism as those unique and memorable food experiences. That's what we should aim for in Ireland, and that's what we can be. Thank you very much. I suppose, stay there just for a second, we just have a few minutes for, sure. for, for a chat before we move on. Just two things that I took from what you were saying there. We need to tell the story. I mean, that's the centre in a way, isn't it? Yeah. To all notions of experiential tourism. You've got to have the story. And for instance, it was raised already this morning, you know, we have grass-fed around the year beef. I go to France, I have never had beef like I have in Ireland. No. I go to France, I have never had oysters like I have in Ireland. But telling that story is something that maybe we don't train people to do. And no. it's, it's a fantastic story. I mean, I know myself when I'm somewhere and somebody is able, for instance in France, to come over and say, well, it's that sort of an oyster, or it's that sort of a dish, or this is how I cooked it, it's an old Breton recipe, these are the sort of pots I use. Do you know, everything that goes with the story. We haven't quite learned to tell that story, and yet we have a fantastic story to tell. We, we have a beautiful story to tell. I think there's a few things going on. H historically, we haven't had the confidence yeah. To, to believe we could stand up there with other countries in terms of food. We're not quite there yet, but we do have the mix of landscape people and produce that other countries don't. France has a much richer heritage of food, no doubt. 
but we can tell the stories. And I've had those moments um, where someone in, in Mayo would say, do you know why that lamb tastes like it does? It's because it eats the grass that grows beside the sea and there's a bit of heather and yeah. that's why they don't add the salt. And all of a sudden you're going, wow, I cannot eat this lamb anywhere else. And that yeah. lamb is completely free range. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But also, you know that greeting we have, what's the story? Yeah. We love stories. That's how we talk. We, it comes, it, it connects us. We, it's relatable. Yeah. We just have to apply that to the way we, we serve tourists. Yeah.